Hello and welcome to episode 117 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my live streaming career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. In this episode, a chat full of wonderful memories and some curveballs that I know you're going to love as I'm joined by former political editor of the Sunday Times, David Cracknell. Now, David is not only a huge Paul Weller fan who has been inspired by our podcast subject for so much of his life, but he's also taken DC Lee to Prime Minister's Questions. And here's the thing, he played piano on a single by Gabrielle and Paul Weller called Why, the story of which we will discover in our chat. Another fabulous guest for you. Let's get into it. David, Cracknell, thanks for joining me. Thank you. I'm delighted, very excited to be here. Um, I'm a big fan of the podcast and uh, I've been sort of binge listening to it like a box set up and down the country. I've been in the car a lot, any excuse. And actually, unfortunately, you can't say your podcast is net zero, but nevertheless, it's brilliant. <laughs> oh, well, bless you. That's really lovely to hear. Hey, look, I'm really looking forward to digging into your stories because there's some really nice quirky connections with Mr. Weller as we'll take through this journey in this conversation, which is really cool. I love this. Excellent. Yeah, I look forward to it. Let's kick off with you as a fan because I'm imagining it kicks in with the jam, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was born in uh, 1968, 10 years almost to the day after Paul. So when the jam split up, I was about 14. In 79, I just started uh, big school, uh, as we called it. Actually, at start, my best mate who sat next to me at school was into the specials and madness and stuff. I loved that look and quite a lot of uh, our school uniform was kind of developed into, uh, you know, uh, black stay press trousers and they were too short and white socks and loafers and my friend, Tim Hewitt, who became a teacher at the school, actually, he wore jam shoes to school and got away with it. And actually, they were black. They were they were black ones, so that was okay. But they were so sharp. I mean, you know, you could really hurt somebody with, uh, with, with those in the shins, you know. He got me into music, actually, I think, proper music before then. I can remember buying the only record I bought was Black Beauty theme music, twinned with, B-side, um, Hawaii Five-0. Uh, theme music. <laughs> now, I don't know what that combination was, but there is a connection I've realized since listening to your podcast. Because I grew up in Woodford and there was a record shop there. And of course, I didn't realise that Eddie Piller, who's about six years older than me, was leading the Woodford mods there. I mean, I don't think I was cool enough, you know, and I was a bit younger. So, uh, but I didn't realise Woodford was this sort of mecca for for moddom. I'm amazed. Um, And he's a West Ham fan, which obviously you have to be when you come from East London. So, you know, my parents are from East End. So, you know, I didn't realise it was such a hub. So I was into the specials and madness. Then I had a friend called Grant Phillips who lived in, in Woodford up the Moncombs, which is a bit posher than, than our end of Woodford. And mums were friends and he, uh, you know, smoked at school and he was like, you know, cooler and had a Parker and he was kind of a bit of a mod. He had a girlfriend, you know, amazing. And <laughs> went round, we, had play, we weren't, you know, close mates because he was a bit cooler than me and um, hang around with the kids who had been at the school longer since they were like seven. He had This Is The Modern World and I remember going around because her mum's her friends, as I say, and so I went to his room and he had This is the Modern World. And I remember looking at that cover, the sort of dressed down kind of pool in that jumper. And I, I didn't realise it was gaffer tape, those arrows. But I instantly I saw there was something about him made the hair stick up. But I think it was a bit of a man crush at the time. And you sort of think, God, he just looks like one of the really cool older kids at school who just knows what he's doing. Love the music. And I love that album. And I will always stand up for it. I don't think it was that bad at all. And in fact, I was listening to it the other day and uh, some of those lyrics are great uh, I think also actually I bought Going Underground but I didn't really get it but I think that was like the second record after Black Beauty I bought in 1980 I looked it up as March so that must have been yeah I was in the first year of secondary school but I wasn't really into it until this modern world thing happened and, and Grant and everything and we ended up going to the final jam gigs at Wembley but I must mention something that happened which is very moving actually at the time a boy who was a year older than me called Colin Chitty was a mod and very cool one of these older kids who was cool and actually I remember um you know I said something to him about the jam or something and he, he sort of looked at me really angry and gave me a bit of a slap as if you know you're just a, a little kid not fit to talk about it anyway very <laughs> very very tragically Colin Chitty died about a month later I think it was 80 81 there was there was a bad winter and we had snow and I don't know whether he slipped on the ice because one day we were all playing snow snowballs and everything at school and the next day it was like very somber or whether he had some kind of stroke or something at the age of 14 but he died suddenly and it was absolutely shocking and desperately sad as you can imagine I'm sort of 12 13 because he was such a big fan of the jam 
we actually had the funeral uh, at our school. We had a, a school chapel. It was a very minor sort of private school called Forest, you know, sort of place where Arthur Daly sends his kids. In Dean Moore, Bobby Moore's son was in my year and Terry Bennell's daughters were there, you know, that kind of thing. And we had a chapel and I remember the coffin coming in and we all sat there as a whole school and the vicar was very trendy and quite cool. And I remember when John Lennon died, he, the next day he played us Imagine in for morning assembly. But at the funeral, Colin Chitty, they finished the eulogy and they said, we're going to play Colin's favourite song. And it's called Man in the Corner Shop by The Jam. And that opening, um, you know, I was sort of coming back to me now, I'm getting prickles, you know, the opening arpeggios of that and the, when that comes in, can you imagine in this chapel when you're 12? It was like haunting. I think that sort of instilled it anyway. By December 1982, I had sort of adopted them, the sort of mod thing and Grant Phillips and I went to see one of the last gigs at Wembley, although we sort of sat quite high up and far away. And I don't remember much about it other than it was very exciting, obviously, the the build up. And I remember walking out afterwards and it was a, my ears sort of like virtually deaf, but it was kind of sad a bit, I suppose. It was a bit somber, but um, it was obviously a, just a great performance. But it's not like being at the front or anything. We were quite far back. So I can't remember much about it other than that. Lots of people have talked on this podcast about the jam being their band. Is that how you felt as kids then at that stage towards the end of the, the jam's lifespan? <laughs> yes, but... I think um, it's been always been Paul Weller, really, for me. Obviously, I really got into them only about a year before they split. And when they split, I think I was upset, but I wasn't like devastated or anything. And I, I worked this out just now. It was just over four months before Speak Like a Child came out. So I was I loved that and I was, you know, straight on to it. But it was really, um, I think, some something about Paul Weller and his lyrics and, you know, The Gift was fantastic. That was my first kind of album that I loved. But I bought sound effects, I think, which is, and, and Setting Suns, I remember singing that to myself for a long time. You know, that was a great album. No, it was always Paul, really. And I sort of think, looking back and thinking about this podcast and talking to you, he's influenced me a lot in my life and career decisions in a strange sort of way. But when I quit the Sunday Times and journalism after about 15 years, I got to what I thought was what I always wanted to be. And that was a political editor of a major newspaper. And I'd done it for seven years and I got to the end of it. And I suppose, I think I sort of thought to myself, no, I'm going to do something different. You know, I'm not going to be complacent and hang around for years and years and years. And like the old fellows who are political editors for 30 years or something, I always thought, you know, I'll do something different, you know, and change my life around. And I sort of think that's probably a bit of that, that jam splitting up mentality. Yeah. Blow it all up. Why not? See what's next. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, I mean, the new, I was in the news game, you know, and everything you know like Paul Weller it's always like what's next you know what happened yesterday was old news so I wasn't too upset about it to be honest uh, let's talk about the Star Council so you enter the world of politics as a journalist and yeah that band and Paul's lyrics at that time what he was saying as we head into the things like the miners strike and red wedge and all that stuff I mean so much of it was political content for want of a better expression you must appreciate that having having done the kind of job that you did for that 15 years period in, in a different way to, to many I would expect yeah I did appreciate those lyrics and from an early age and all the the, the miners strike walls come tumbling down and those kind of messages it was very powerful it was so strange because nobody was really doing that. I mean, there was a few artists, the Red Wedge stuff, obviously, but nobody was really that um, that political, overtly, and getting away with it, with su- wrapped up in such wonderful tunes, you know, from Family Trees, The Dukes Do Swing, you know, fantastic song. I remember that Gold Diggers, watching that Gold Diggers live with that lovely Herb Aria Red guitar he had, the Herb Ellis, I, I realise now, and um, I, I actually got one of those in the end because of him, and, um, you know, some of his lyrics were just, were, were just great, and I think it did probably influence me, and made me interested in politics, definitely. I mean, I studied law and I sort of thought that actually when I started to do constitutional stuff about what Thatcher did with the law to sort of get through her reforms was what did it. But I was probably already thinking that because it uh, got my attention because of Paul Weller. Two weeks after that, Gold Diggers on TV, I was at the Ipswich Gaumont to see the same concert. Couldn't get tickets for London. And my dad drove me and my mate Adam up to Ipswich really early, like at lunchtime on the Saturday, and left us there. And then the poor thing, I think I realised now he must have driven all the way back to London, waited for about five hours, and then came and got us <laughs> at midnight. It's so very sweet of him. We got there about you know, three o'clock and we waited out the back and Paul came up 
you know, got off the coach and in his lovely um, Mac at the time. And unlike Gold Diggers, he actually had his hair slicked back and was wearing a pinstripe suit then, looked very dapper. And he signed the autograph. And do you know what? It's weird because I don't think I've, I've still got it or anything. I don't, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. So it was, it was over and done with. That was amazing. We were fairly near the front. And I think with my mate Adam, he bought a drum kit and I bought a guitar and we started jamming in his garage from then on. And that was it. Paul when he walked on, you know, towering above us with his with his uh, pinstripe suit, slip back hair. You know, he was so cool. I mean, it was uh, it, it, yeah, it's hard not to be still influenced by that that style. Such a different sound and such a different energy in that gig to the jam, like you say, just a few months beforehand in terms of how they play and the performance and all that. But and the songs, these this kind of jazz influence. That was that was clearly your bag from the beginning of the Star Council as well, then. Yeah, absolutely. I love the Apari EP and all that kind of French button down shirts and sort of like sweaters sort of carefully draped over your over your shoulders, you know, all that kind of look. That was fantastic. The white jeans, as you've talked about. It was wonderful and it was so exciting experimental and so different. And I can I just say as well, I think the thing about Modern World, as other people have said, is it was only six months after the first album. But what I like about it is that it is so different. And that is that is the thing about Paul Weller's music is that he can change so quickly and get into something. So as I say, I sort of picked up the guitar around that time and had to have the sort of like same guitar as him if I could if I could save up my pocket money and got some tapes and and taught myself um, to play a few chords and and stuff. And my friend Mark Denby was brilliant at the piano, had done all the grade eight stuff, but he could just pick up any tune. So me and him then started a little band and recorded uh, a few very, funnily enough, very similar to that kind of style council jazzy kind of sound. (laughs) I wonder where we got that from. <laughs> it was quite a, a bit of an embarrassing story, but we, when Live Aid com, came about, we we sort of like said, oh, let's have a Live Aid at our school, you know. And one of my mates sort of managed to somehow get the phone number of Billy Bragg and we got through to him. It took us hours to sort of pluck up the courage to phone him up. And he said, yeah, yeah I'll throw in a few uh, uh, signed photos or something. But me and Mark, he had just passed the driving test. We went, we drove up to Solid Bond Studios and sat outside for about four hours until I think, uh, to my shame, he went, he went up to the reception and and said, you know, I don't know what he said. He was out in about two minutes, whether whether Paul wasn't there or anything. But you know, the idea that imagine that conversation. You know, could Paul give um, give some signed photos or something to a, a very minor private school in East London for their little live aid gig? You know how that would have gone down. I don't know. But uh, anyway, <laughs> shortly after that, anyway, I. I volunteered myself as to be school house music captain and we had a competition every year and there was eight houses. I did one of my own compositions, you know, it was basically a style council ripoff or something, organised all the other stuff. Anyway, um, we came last out of eight. I know we went on first because I said... um, you know, I've got my driving test. Actually, could I? Can we go on first? So I w- we did our our little set, and then went off for a few hours. Came back. Oh, you've come last. I said, okay, fair enough. But I passed my driving test, so I didn't. I didn't care. Actually, that was fine. <laughs> well, look, it does get better in terms of the musical side of your career. And th- let's talk through this connection with with Weller and, and getting to play with Weller because this is amazing, right? So this is um, 2007. The song came out, Gabrielle. Yes, yep. Gabrielle, Dreams Come True and all that business. Her album Always, but there's a track that was released as a single to promote that album called Why. And a massive big production. There was like the London Studio Orchestra. Um, the right. song itself was based around Wildwood. Mr. Weller, it was rather just sampling it. Paul plays guitar, he's on backing vocals as well. I didn't realise until looking up you know, more details about this that David McCormick was involved, McCormick and Butler as well. Yeah, yeah awesome I know, somewhere. it's amazing. It was, a, it was quite, it got quite a production. And then there he is, David Crackers Cracknell on piano. <laughs> I know. Uh, what the heck? How did this happen? I know. I know. I can't believe it still. Uh, I mean, it's weird as well. We can we can come to it if you want, but I got friendly with DC Lee about a year before that. So, but this has got nothing to do with that. It was a complete coincidence. Sometime in 2007, around the early summer, I got friendly with a couple of blokes called Andy Dean and Ben Wolf, who were the Boiler House Boys. I think they had done some of Gabrielle's albums in the past or singles. They were sort of DJs and producers. And I think I met them at sort of so a House or Century Club or something in London and you know, I, I did a lot of drinking for the Sunday Times. It was my duty, put it this way. Uh, I, you know, I was told at the beginning, here's a credit card, breakfast, lunch and dinner, you know, just get the stories. Um, it's probably like, you know, 
giving an A&R man the credit card, as long as you get the bands, you know, you can spend what you like. I got to hang out with them a bit, met them and got talking about music. And they, I think, were interested in me, particularly because the Sunday Times and they had a sort of software proposal, which was the idea of what we now probably know as sort of, I don't know, Apple Genius or something, personalized recommendations of, you know, if you've got a couple of tracks on an album, then it would say, oh, did you know you could get the rest of it or here's some other tracks you might like. I mean, that, that happens as standard now. And I think they were just too late with it because, it, you know, already by 2007, I think Apple, the iPhone was out and all that thing. But they had this sort of software and they were trying to sort of push it to Sunday Times as a kind of Sunday Times music club thing. And so I said, yeah, it sounds good. I was excited by that. I'll mention it to the powers that be, you know, and see what happens. And, and they did look at it for a bit. And during that time, maybe, I don't know, we were hanging out a lot or whether it was sort of to ingratiate themselves. <laughs> but we were talking about whether uh, I, they knew I was kind of a massive fan, and and they said, "Well, we're doing uh, we're doing this, Gabriel. The the album's uh, nearly finished, but they the record company have asked us to." do a couple of tracks and with her. So when one day they handed me a demo, I was looking at the the only sort of copy I've got of this um, that's left. And I've actually got a demo here, which they wow. must have given on, as well as the, the the actual final product. They said, I think you like this. I think you like this, you know. Um, I said, oh yeah. So I played it. I was like, oh yeah, I see what you've done there. And it was just basically playing Wildwood as the actual, you know, recorded track. And Gabrielle, who I, who I loved as well. And she was kind of humming and sort of uh, going, you know, the road is long and the blood blah, 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 blah. You know, and I was like, oh yeah, okay, that's how they make records. And oh yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, that's that's brilliant. Well done. And they said, uh, about a month later, said, we're going to be in the, we're going to do this. We're going to, she loves it. You know, we're going to be in the studio. Do you want to come along and watch? And I was like, yeah, love to. I love Gabrielle. You know, I remember her, her hit singles, massive. You know, and and then like I don't know. A few days later, they said, um, "Oh yeah, and actually we've um, we've got we've got we've got on to Paul Weller as well, and he, he quite fancies coming too." And I was like, Are "You okay with that?" And I said, uh, "Yeah, yeah, okay. I think I can I can make a gap <laughs> in my diary for that." And they said, "But look." David, you've got to be, uh, you've got to be cool, right? You you can't, you know, you can't be going, going, oh, I love you, Paul, and all this sort of stuff. I said, don't worry, don't worry. I said, you know, I'll, I'll be fine. So anyway, the day comes and they say, um, be down at Chiswick Studios, um, got there about half eight or so, about half an hour before Paul arrived. And, and you know, I'm like nervous as hell and kind of, you know, just be cool, just be cool. And uh, I thought, you know, don't wear a Feb Perry or anything stupid like that. Yeah, you, know, you don't make it look like, you know, you know, just wear something normal, boring, you know, T-shirt, something. So I'm sitting on there on the uh, ubiquitous uh, brown leather sofa in the control room, you know, at the back, just sitting there. I'm thinking, right, this is my position. Just shut up, be part of the wallpaper and take it in. So it in. Anyway, uh, there's all his guitars there lined up, which uh, his roadie, I think it's Roger you've, you've had on, isn't it? Who, who must have come in earlier and left them there. There's three or four guitars, acoustic. There's the SG and it's like, you know, it's on its stand and it's right in front of me. And I'm just thinking, oh my God, shall I just pick that up and run? <laughs> you know, and never be seen again. It is know? tempting, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like that that guitar, my God. Anyway, I had, obviously I had to get one of them as well eventually. Um, so he comes in and he starts, you know, just unpacking his guitar and having a little play around and every, there's loads of people there there was the photographer as well Lawrence um, he did the video oh Lawrence Watson yeah yeah and you can see so it was all kind of done on the on the sort of you know uh, that day it was like let's do a bit of a video as well which is it's just a bit of people in the studio you can see me just about in the background I think and there's loads of people milling about say oh how are you you know blah 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 you know and Gabrielle comes in and you know or had she not come there no she hadn't arrived yet so it was just kind of blokes and kind of studio people and it was loads of people so I just sat there you know quite happily and then all of a sudden like you know there was a silence and the sea parted in my mind you know and suddenly I was aware looked up everyone had somehow gone out for a coffee or gone somewhere else to plug leads in and there was Paul Weller in front of me with a guitar and it was me and I looked around and I thought it's just us in this room for this you know and I'm like oh my god you know if I don't say anything then that would be weird so I go, uh, uh, Paul. Um, what are you do? What are you up to now, then, Paul? You know, in a kind of I know what you know what I'm doing, just casual way. Anyway, expecting him to say mumble something or say you know not really pay attention. He got up, walked over right to me, and sat next to me. And I'm like, oh shit, what have I done? <laughs> yeah. He goes, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're doing Glastonbury and we're rehearsing and stuff like that. Yeah. So um, yeah, what about you, you guys? Are you uh, are you doing the uh, the whole album or or just a couple of tracks? And I went, yeah. <laughs> and he goes, and he goes, 
yeah, but no, no. Are, are you doing the whole album for Gab or are you doing the tracks? And I was like, oh, uh, oh I don't know. Um, you'll have to have Andy or, or Ben or something like that. And I, I don't know. Anyway, I can't even remember what happened after that. We chatted <laughs> away again. I asked another question and blagged it. But I think he just thought I was somebody from the studio, part of their lot. And funnily enough, I remember Gabriel, after he had left, said to me, um, oh, I thought you were with him. And he obviously thought I was with her. So, you know, I managed to, I managed to get away with it. It was brilliant because we just chatted all day. And I can't really remember much about it, about what we spoke about, apart from we talked about dieting and boozing and having some kind of, he had some kind of thing where he, I remember at the time, he did have a little bit of a paunch in that sort of period. And I remember him saying something about, uh, oh, on tour, you know, do what you want. But when you get off tour, you know, have a bit of a sort of... um, you know, intermittent fast or something like that. You know, it sounded like something like that he did, but, you know, obviously he's off the booze now. And, uh, but that was just before then. I love this dieting tips from Paul Weller. Absolutely. That- <laughs> yeah. You could do a book could do with yeah, my help. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I'm sure he has got lots of thoughts on it. Somebody on your podcast mentioned he, they were chatting to him about e numbers or something. You know, I love all that kind yeah, of uh, random. Yeah, you're right. They did. They did. They did. And, yeah. so, and so, in terms of actually playing, how did that go? And we were just sitting around uh, in the mixing room, and I hadn't realised that oh, everything is new to me. You got to. I mean, Gabrielle in itself, meeting her would have been amazing. I mean, and I didn't realise how recordings work. I mean, he did such an amazing job during that day. He, what struck me, struck me not only was the ordinariness of the conversation but also how professional he was like he would he he hadn't taken this lightly he wasn't just going to come and first of all he recorded the re-recorded the whole um, Wildwood acoustic guitar backing track and so I sort of wandered around it's a really lovely studio it's quite architecturally well designed and you can sort of walk up steps and look down through glass at various parts of the studio I remember walking around the back and looking down seeing him in the studio doing doing that and I, there were mobile phones obviously but you were I, I, I didn't dare do any pictures and it is a regret that I didn't get a picture with him because that would have been fine but anyway he recorded that. And then he had got a notebook out and he started to drop down sort of ideas and chatting with Gabrielle about it. And it was like, he ended up writing this kind of backing lyric as you, as you can tell, it's sort of, he comes in halfway, surprisingly, you know, this male voice. And then he he thought, Oh, should I try this? And should I try that? He did the backing track. And then he comes in the, comes in the control room and plugs in the SG and it's like, oh, right, okay, yeah. And he started to do like guitar solos and stuff like that. But I didn't realise they mic'd up the amp and all that in the thing and you could come back and just plug into the mixing desk with headphones. But the funny thing was, he said um, at one point he was playing with the SG and he was like with the tremolo arm and it was a bit loose and he goes, anyone got a screwdriver? <laughs> and then, to me, in talk about cognitive dissonance, you know, I mean, it was like Paul Weller is asking for sort of, DIY equipment. I mean, it's like I, you know, where, you know, I know not in my immediate <laughs> so I think that I'd be talking uh, to Paul Weller about, you know, a screwdriver, but because you just think, oh, you got people to do that, you know, um, and he does, but I mean, they weren't there at the time. But yeah, now how did it come about? I don't know. Well, I came up with this idea. Obviously, I was being careful, but I, I sort of discussed it with Andy and Ben, and I said, how about when the track ends, you know, when it fades out, why don't you have a little coda or whatever it's called to reference the melody? the main melody because she obviously made up a new melody to her song Why but I said why don't you do a little da 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 you know kind of thing at the end and they said oh that's brilliant yeah I like that Um, why don't you do it Crackers you play piano don't you and I'm like what they were like oh, yeah go on you do it you know it's stuff you know go on so yeah it just kind of happened and um you know i basically was so nervous and i just could, i had to be cool about it everything because you know what else could i do i'd actually only been i'd messed around the piano for years but i mean i only actually had really seriously started playing it a couple of years before when my daughters were young i was desperate for them to learn and we got a piano which is behind me we rented it and i had lessons too and I, I said I wouldn't mind do, be doing it more formally so it was only a couple of years after that it was great experience really it was just um, one of those things I was only four chords on the piano which built it up but then at the end you can just about hear like that kind of coda sort of idea just for a couple of seconds so I was pleased with that Nice. Oh my goodness. What a great tale. I love that. <laughs> I mean funny thing was I had got to know DC Lee. I was a bit nervous about telling her. I said because she was very fierce about, you know, people not knowing, wanting to know her because of Paul. And it wasn't that at all. We were just great mates. And I said, I played with Paul on a thing. And she said, really? I said, yeah, yeah, I know it's bizarre, but you know those guys, Ben and Andy? Oh, yeah, yeah, vaguely, yeah. I said, well, they sort of, you know, it all got out of hand and they said, you know, come and play. And I was like, so I'm very surprised about that, David. She said, Paul usually doesn't let anyone play the piano. He plays piano. And I was like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It'd have been even more furious if he found out you weren't a musician. <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, this 
this is it, Dan. This is the this is the funny thing about it is that he had no idea who I was, and I didn't want to say you know I was a journalist, but then I wasn't there as a journalist, you know, and I was a political journalist. I wasn't a music journalist, so you know I was just there um, as a fan, um, pretending to be some kind of studio person, <laughs> session musician. Love it. I, love I think it. it's the only musical collaboration Paul Weller has ever done with somebody he didn't know he was doing it. But <laughs> there you go. Let's talk about the journalism side then. So when did your career in journalism start? Because it was a, I mean, pretty impressive in terms of like the Sunday Telegraph, the Press Association, and like you mentioned, finally, political editor of the Sunday Times. I would always wanted to be a writer, still do. Uh, at university, I was studying law, and I was lined up to kind of be a barrister or something, but I uh, really wanted to be a writer, and I extended my university career by doing postgrad for a couple of years. And in those days, you didn't have to pay for it. So it was great. I think it was the last kind of couple of years where you didn't have to pay tuition fees and things. So, And I wrote short story and that was published. And it was published by a university paper that I went in one day and said, do you want anything doing? I'm, I've got a, a free afternoon. They said, go and interview. You know, we're doing something on homelessness. So I went out and got drunk with a tramp and wrote a piece. <laughs> that was it, really. I wanted to be a journalist from then on. And I spotted early on, and I was interested in politics, thanks to Paul and my degree, but I spotted early on that the political editors always got on the front page in those days when there was more broadsheets. Political editors would have a couple of stories and it just seemed like it's the it's the front man thing. You know, you want to be up front playing the guitar and singing the vocals. So a p- political editor seemed to me, you know, that was the um, journalistic equivalent of being the of being a, a bit of a rock star <laughs> in <It's> that sort <laughs> of way. <laughs> what a crazy thought. Eh? There you and go. It's also important to say the Times and the Sunday Times, two completely separate things, separate team separate publications yeah traditionally conservative paper but the Blair years it was it was very much behind New Labour wasn't it that's right yeah it was behind uh, you know if you look at the leaders people say oh influence of the proprietor and all that but actually if you look at the leaders between the Sunday Times and say the Sun you know which was which obviously Murdoch was more interested in we were pretty much left alone but yeah we were a, we were a fan of New Labour and, and you know I was a, fa- a fan of Tony Blair uh, at the start anyway you know so I think he did an amazing job to bring Labour back from the brink, although a lot of the hard work was done by Neil Kinnock. Not the Red Wedge tour, but, you know, he did do a lot of the sort of reform in the 80s that allowed Blair to take that over. You know, they were talking about those sorts of things. It was probably just a bit ahead of its time. The thing is, you don't make it that easy for Mr Blair when he's in, right? <laughs> they were, no, that's my <laughs> At the job. time, there yeah. were all these massive scoops coming out of Whitehall and coming out of Cabinet Office and Government and like the inner workings of Government. Yeah. To the point they kind of launched this internal inquiry on cabinet office leaks at one point, right? So, I guess, but I guess that's the point. It's like you have to hold these people to account. Well, that is the point, yeah. I remember Tony Blair didn't call us in very often for lunch, as you can imagine, but he did call, call me in once and sat me down next to him with my editor. And as he sort of like pulled my chair back to usher me to my seat, he said, oh, well, you know, we'd love to know where you're getting all your stories, David. And I said, I bet you would, Prime Minister. And Alastair Campbell sort of grunted over from the, across the corner of the room. Yeah, it was, look, I, I started, uh, I got into journalism and I got into political journalism and I wanted to be a political editor. And, you know, it was, you wanted to be like Woodward and Bernstein, you know, from all the president's men, you know, you wanted to be, uh, you know, Robert Redford in an, in the film. You, you wanted to be that journalist who had uncovered the scoop and, found wrongdoing and brought down a dodgy prime minister or, or a president. You know, I wasn't political. I had, I stayed absolutely personally objective. It was quite an art because obviously you had to deal with all sorts of uh, uh, colours of MPs and you always, um, I, I never said what, you know, how I voted or anything. And um, you just sort of made made sure that they thought that you were one of them. It was difficult on the Sundays because you, you have all week. And but at the same time, the pressure is on to break stories for what's going to happen for the following week or set the agenda. And again, a sort of Paul thing, you know, you want to be ahead of the game and uh, you want to be doing new stuff, not not looking back at what happened in the last week. You know, I just wanted to, my, I thought it was my duty to sort of like examine and, and uh, you know, investigate politicians. And uh, Tony Blair wasn't perfect, as we know, and the Iraq war was coming in my time. And, you know, there was so much pressure you know, to get stories as well. When I started to get um, leaked documents from people, to me, you couldn't argue with those. If somebody put something in a brown paper envelope and you arrived on your desk or that wasn't the case with me. I knew who was giving me his stuff. Nobody could argue with a leaked document. All the all the broadcasters would have to follow it up. There was a bit of a reputation of Sunday journalism, you know, before that, where it was like there was too many stories that said one person said and one minister said, and it was all a bit unsourced. By having these 
documents on the record. It was amazing. You know, some of the doubts about the Iraq war that some of the cabinet members shared, I revealed. I mean, I, I, I think I think I helped to stop this country getting ID cards because I revealed that Blunkett had um, plans for those. And that seems a bit big brother. Yeah. I mean, it was um, interesting times and elections and so on. They were always good fun. Is there a bit of you that's with the chaos about what's been going on over the past couple of years with Brexit and, you know, and uh, Boris and all that and COVID and everything? Is there a bit of you that's like, oh, I'd love to be in that world again right now? No, because I just had enough of it. I, I To be honest with you, I was <laughs> I was thinking, I bumped into somebody I used to know in politics last night and they were saying, oh, do you miss it? And and I because I was coming on here, I thought, I said to him, I thought the perfect answer to that, do I miss it? It's a bit like asking Paul Weller if he misses the jam. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you, you've done you've done that you enjoyed it at the time but I just find it tedious a bit now I'm Boris Johnson I'm a, I mean it's beyond a shocking joke never thought he'd become prime minister even to say it's appalling to me is just boring because it's so obviously politicians whether you agree with them the prime minister in my when I was there at least they were professional and they were sort of, I mean, I know people think, oh, they're all the same. Well, they're, they're not actually. And actually, I might mention a story if we've got time about my good friend, Alan Johnson, who was a mod, you know, now a successful author. Uh, and his son, Jamie, worked for Paul. You should get him on, actually. He did Heavy Soul. He was the sound engineer. Uh, I got a tape of that and uh, in advance, which was fantastic. So it didn't do any harm being in politics and, and Paul Weller. But I don't really miss it. I find it a bit tedious. People used to have a bit of more integrity even if you didn't agree with their politics, Tory, Labour, Lib Dem, whatever, that prime ministers would, would resign, ministers would resign. I think the last person with honour to do that was probably Amber Rudd over the uh, Commonwealth scandal. Boris Johnson just wasn't going to go until he absolutely had to. Well, it's a fascinating world. And um, coming from a background of journalism myself at the BBC, it was something that I kind of, you know, at one point I wanted to follow that and then decided to be a DJ who plays lots of tunes in the morning and talks pop and prattle and all that. But, you know, who knows? In a in a um, in an alternative universe, in the multiverse, I'm, I'm kind of in that world as well. There's one other thing we should talk about from the political angle with you know, being mates with DC Lee around that time. Yeah. Didn't you take it to PMQs? I did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> Love yeah. it. It's, it's hilarious because actually we met and she was talking to Sheree Blair. I went to a black tie dinner in about 2006, I was invited and I, I never liked putting on black tie and all that sort of stuff. So I was a bit grumpy and turned up they're having sort of like, um, you know, drinks in the in the lobby of this hotel before going into this ballroom. And uh, my wife said to me, oh, look, there's Cherie Blair. And I looked over and I was like, yeah, well, who's that lady talking to her? That looks like it can't be DC Lee. I was like. And my wife goes, yeah, yeah, I think it is. And, you know, he spent the whole night. We ended up being on the sort of table very near her. My host, the guy who invited me from a PR firm, said, I kept saying, oh, you know, look over. And is that DC Lee? Yeah, it's DC Lee. So I went, went to the loo, came back. Then about five minutes later, DC Lee comes over and says hello to me. And the guy had basically um, sort of given a donation to charity and gone over to her and said, if you go over to my mate, I'll write a check to this charity. So she was like, hello, it's David, isn't it, or something? And I was like, what? Um, yeah, how, oh, how like, nice to meet you, you know, um, Miss Lee or something. You know. Anyway, got chatting and I said, um, if you're interested, you know, it's all, it's all I had, you know, I was like, you know, um, I can get you, a, I can get you a seat in the House of Commons to uh, to watch Prime Minister's questions and we could have some lunch or something afterwards. Anyway, she said, yeah, yeah, I'm up for that. So I sorted that out. I think it was Alan Johnson, actually, who got me the, the seats because they had the allocation. Anyway, we went to the House of Commons, uh, took her around, you know, watched PMQs with Blair. Then we went for a nice lunch in Westminster with, uh, with with a couple of her friends and we just became I don't know whether it was the weirdness or just the chat we just got on very well um, turns out very nearly had the same birthday she's the 4th of June I'm the 5th quite into that sort of Gemini thing and Paul's a Gemini you know I heard about, all about that but you know we just got friendly and then over the years then it was like when I left Sunday Times I was getting into PR and it was like discuss whether I would help her with her PR and that kind of thing and I met her uh, manager and all that and she was doing a couple of little gigs and so on that we went to. I went to the Holland Park house that they shared. I mean, that was amazing. It was like, I was so tempted to sort of, you know, look in the cupboards and so Can I just pop up to the attic, see if there's any uh, <laughs> any old uh, mementos there? You know, you don't want this old rubbish, do you? It was funny, but I mean, the, the greatest memory I've got is, um, believe it or not, in politics, there's a lot of it wannabe uh, rock stars in, in politics. Like Tony Blair famously was in a rock band called The Ugly Rumours. But there was also around that time, a lot of people were going to carry out Tom Watson MP and Michael Duggar MP and, and some of the Brownites who were pushing to get rid of Blair. That was a heavy time of leaking from Gordon Brown's camp 
to uh, uh, to undermine Tony Blair after the third election victory. It was like, right, thanks very much. Now it's my turn. There was a lot of karaoke bars and things like that. And people, they loved going there and singing at night. And sometimes Tom Watson, you'd be, he'd be in one room, another MP would do another. And sometimes they were just on their own because they just loved singing. You know, Ed Balls, you know, was there, you know. <laughs> and, and I managed to drag DC Lee to it because she was a bit like, oh, don't do that sort of thing, love, you know. Um, I was like, well, come on, you know, we're going out for a few drinks. And um, so we ended up in this... Uh, Lucky Voice in Soho and it was like yeah let's do that so I was like what, what do you want to do now David I said um, could we do um, Walls Come Tumbling Down because Dee did a fantastic backing on that she was brilliant on that so we did Walls Come Tumbling Down together on karaoke <laughs> I did my best kind of Paul at Live Aid impression, you know, all the the gesturing movements, you know, and all that. And she she came in with, you know, but keep your slaves to the HP, you know, all that. And I was like, oh my God, did somebody record that on their phone? I mean, you know, it was amazing. A lot of leaking and a lot of politics and gossip was done in karaoke bars at politics at the time. It was so the Brownites were undermining Blair so much. I remember Brown actually changed his phone number because he didn't want Tony Blair to keep phoning him. I mean, I never revealed that because it would have dropped people in at the time, but that's how bad it was. The Chancellor of the Exchequer changed his phone number because he didn't want the Prime Minister phoning him all the time. <laughs> oh my God, that's it out. I, I got to know Leah a bit as well, and she used to call me Mr. Crackhead, um, which <laughs> absolutely, I can categorically say that uh, it's, it's just a play on words, but not, uh, not based on any evidence or anything like that. Now tell me what they did when you left the Sunday Times as well. Yeah, I've got this here behind me. Yeah, well, I always wanted one of those front pages, you know, that a fake front page you uh, you get on Fleet Street when you leave and you retire. So I said, do me a front page. I really want that, you know. And I left it to them because and on your leaving do they present it to you. And uh, it wasn't, it was only about a year or two after the uh, Paul Weller incident. And so they got me this Sunday Times front page, uh, rather cheesy picture of me and David Cameron, who was uh, uh, big at the time, if you remember. Head start for happiness all round as crackers leaves whopping <laughs> part-time <laughs> reporter starts pop career and it was all kind of roughly based on the, uh, the the joke that you know he's only pretending to be a political journalist you know he's a cover for wanting to be a rock star which is probably <laughs> true now we're here we're into 30 years of paul weller solo career now we talked the jam the style council obviously weller solo is a huge big thing for you right absolutely yeah i mean that was that was fun you know amazing i mean i went to the famous infamous newport gig by the way with 40 people i think there were more than that if it was then we were 10 percent of that but um my brother-in-law was um actually studying at Newport. So he said, oh, Paul Weller is playing. I went, oh yeah, I'll be up for that. And we went down there and it was a big hall and it wasn't full, but um, I do remember it. It was fantastic. And put, there was a trestle table with people selling these t-shirts with the targets and stuff. And I thought, well, oh, hello, you know, is it going back to that sort of jammy thing? Is it a bit desperate? But it was a great gig. It was such a lot of like one of those things where a flip of a coin, it could have gone either way and unfortunately it went the right way but you you felt that will it work will it work i'm not sure i you know it was that early you know it was kind of almost like a student gig or something back in the day but i love that but he did it didn't he those early days were really special so so many amazing gigs and you were at that brixton gig that max beasley took, was was playing and the, the one that's on vhs and dvd and all that yeah yeah absolutely and and don't they all look amazing and and that was brilliant and so i'd been at the infamous newport gig i wanted to go and and see what had happened and see how it developed and obviously it was paul weller and i got a ticket to brixton academy no one would was interested in going. I mean, that just tells you at the time. So I went on my own. I went really early to get at the front. So I was there like 3 p.m. or something, queuing up, and uh, I got at the front. It was absolutely amazing. And as you say, you heard those kind of songs like Cosmos for the first time, uh, Into Tomorrow. It started with Tin Soldier, which is on his Desert Island disc, isn't it? Yeah, it was an amazing, amazing uh, gig. I mean, at that time, I like the fact that he's dipping back into the jam, he's dipping back into the Style Council, whereas when he got to Wildwood and Stanley Road, Heavy Soul, that was back out of the set list again but the version of precious on that i mean god it's so cool he, he looks so cool the playing is so cool awesome he, he just fell in love with that sort of wah wah sort of pedal and and you know those and he fell in love with guitars again um but not in the jam way but in you know that or you know pedals and you know just creating sounds some of those sounds on the first solo album you know whatever they are that he's experimenting with and songs going you know going into jams at the end when you think they've finished 
just keeping little bits on there. It's so experimental. It's so different, isn't it, from what, what the time was, the early 90s as well. Mm. And so different from that last Style Council album, in a way. Well, here we are 30 years later. We've had Fat Pop last year on Sunset the year before and both number one albums. Yeah. No, I know. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, he just seems to be actually more productive than he ever was, I think. I don't know what the rate is, but he's so at peace with himself, I think. You can tell that, can't you? He's got to an age. He's happy. In, in his relationship. And I think look, not drinking is amazing. I, I've stopped drinking now and I, I feel a lot better as well. Again, that was probably slightly influenced by him. Didn't do it straight away. You just feel um, you don't get angry about stuff so much. And he's in his stride, isn't he? He just can't do a bad song, really. Or he maybe he does and he throws them away. But, you know, it's all good. My son bought me on Sunset on vinyl. He's into vinyl. Yeah, so. I, just, I just got back into it again. And so it's, uh, God, I mean, there's another, there's two albums about to arrive today. And I need oh, to get, I need to get to the front door before exciting. my wife does. I to, yeah, I need to get to the front door before my wife does, though, because she'll go ballistic. But on eBay, I can sit there and, 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 you know, I mean, my parents actually threw out my jam records, not out of any spite. It was just, I think there was a period in, I don't know, the 90s or something when I was, wasn't living there anymore. My mum was a bit of a, you know, clean, cleaner freak. And she claims that I said she could do it. But anyway, or she gave them to my cousin or something. So I've had to rebuild. So I've been on eBay spending silly money on kind of first presses of all those records that I had. I remember I waited ages to get one uh, a copy of The Gift with the candy. I wanted it with a candy stripe bag because I had that. I managed to get that a couple of months ago with uh, with the old piece of sellotape, all yellow and everything. But it could be mine. Who knows? That's the way <laughs> I look at it, Dan. <laughs> Wouldn't that be lovely? Yeah, exactly. You're buying back your stuff again. <laughs> this has been so lovely. I've loved chatting with you. I have two final questions for you, David. So you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be the Jam, the Style Council or Solo. What are you going to go with? Well, I've, I've thought, I actually have thought a lot about this and, um, you know, I, I, a bit of a short list. I mean, you know, I'm out of the sinking, the classic mod track. Um, Sunflower has been my, um, I can't get it off my phone for some reason. I've changed phones. It still sort of repeats it. But Sunflower, the opening riff of that is my phone and I don't get bored with that. But I thought, I work for a charity called Woodland Heritage now I, I and they're into preserving woodlands and woodland management. And uh, you realise that some of your guests have talked about Paul's reference to nature uh, in quite a lot of his songs. I wanted something from the first solo album, so I'm going to go, and um, Eddie Pillar already nicked uh, Ball Rush, which I can't, I can't get out of my head. I love that. But I'm going to go with Amongst Butterflies. You know, God was there amongst the trees, hear his whisper in the summer breeze. And that kind of summer playing in the woods, um, I think he played Cowboys and Indians with his dad, and, you know, that kind of feeling that, you know, holidays would go on forever. In the woods, there was a soldier's tomb, ghost of which looked over you. I grew up in Epping Forest and I went to a school called Forest School. So, you know, it was that for me, that that just conjures up that, that kind of summers when you're a kid. And, uh, and that, I think that's what he wanted to do. I love these connections to songs. I mean, it's just such a powerful thing, music, isn't it? So, to music and lyrics that mean so much to people in different ways. Also, uh, can I just mention a second thing, the combine on the modern world, the references to news quite a lot in Paul Weller's songs. What is it? It's Sunday Papers and the Dailies, Ina Sharp Page Three Girls, News at Ten, War in Rhodesia, Far Away in a Distant Land. He was quite a foreign correspondent, even at that age, you know. <laughs> he read the papers, you know. He, he you know, he's uh, he's a knowledgeable man. That may have just been him buying fish and chips, though, to be fair. I, might have <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, look, final question. So, Pepsi's podcast, as you'll know from binging the box set, is yes, it's to meet lovely people like yourself and hear your memories, but really it's to get the interview with Paul Weller that I never managed during my radio career I mean my goodness me it must happen at some point surely soon uh, fingers crossed but if it happens what should I ask him well I think you've got a good angle because it's coming up I realised 40 years to the day when the jam split up on October the 30th so that is the day you're not going to say should I ask him if the jam will, will get back together eh? <laughs> <laughs> no no you know the Guardian used to have those pass notes on politicians and people and it would be like what to say what not to say I think that would be one of them here's another one what's your net worth I think that you shouldn't say that um, I think will you make up with Paolo Hewitt probably not did you vote for Brexit mm, definitely not um, why do you pretend not to know what a pentatonic scale is because it's too muso -y? I mean that's always fascinated me you know why he sort of he knows what I mean when I was there when he was tuning up and he came sat on the sofa, he said something like, oh, what key is it in? And I like, I got out the music and I said, um, I think I find it's A minor, stroke D. But he sort of <laughs> pretends not to know, you know, he, you know, he knows how to 
what every note is, I'm sure. But um, I've come up with, um, what do you do with all those clothes? Because I've never seen him wear the same thing. And they must go somewhere. Does he give them to charity? Does he Has he got them in a, in, in a sort of a shipping container somewhere? What do you do uh, with all those old clothes? Or what do you wish you were asked more? But I expect that'll be music. So I'd go with the clothes. Nice. Neil Chilsby, I don't know if you've heard of his episode yet from Stone Foundation, has been getting the shoes. I'm, I'm a medium, right? I reckon right. Paul's a medium top. Do you reckon? Come on now, you know? This- well, he is now. I mean, as he as he sort of said uh, when he was giving me the dieting tips, you know, you've got to keep the keep the figure, haven't you? I think he said that to Noel Gallagher as well. You've got to keep the figure if you're a rock star. Yeah, he's probably a, a small large or something. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah, a big, yeah. he's not short, is he? Yeah. So okay, that's a great question. Yeah, I could be inheriting some of this stuff. Where's it all go? I like it. Yeah. I think I think also you will get an answer uh, rather, you know, because he he can be a little bit if he doesn't want to talk about something. I think with the clothes that we like, what's, what happens to all those clothes? Where are they? On eBay, maybe he's got a secret eBay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've looked now. <laughs> uh, this has been so lovely. Thank you so much for your time, David. I really uh, appreciate uh, it, man. Until your podcast, I did think I was the world's number one secret secret expert on Paul Weller, but actually, I'm not. You know, <laughs> it, it, that's how he make, he makes you feel, isn't it? My wife's from Godalming, guilt near Guildford. I said, next time we're down there, say, I know this fantastic out of the world curry house it, in Ripley. <laughs> yeah, and sort of go. Um, well, we were, we went there last week, David. Why do you want to go there? I said, oh, it's just brilliant. I love the chicken korma, you know. It's just it's just the best. Yeah. It's a secret, you know, it's but it's the best. Um, Paul, Paul would be like, you're that pianist. You're the pianist from the Gabriel yeah. song, right? It's yeah. you. It's you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Sorry. Crackhead. Mr. Crackhead. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Dan. Cheers. Bye. My thanks once again to David Crackers Cracknell for joining me on the podcast. A real delight to hear his stories. And do check out the show notes for this podcast on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. Whilst you're there, you can show your support by heading to my store as well. You can buy our first official podcast mug and, if you like, a virtual coffee as well. On the roll call this week, doing exactly that taxi driver Ricky B. He says love the podcast Dan. I met you at Steve Pilgrim's gig and what a lovely fella you are. Sorry again for getting your name wrong in the early days. Now I don't know if I've told you this story or not. I can't remember. But Ricky is the taxi driver who in the very early days of this podcast picked up Paul Weller in his taxi and said to Paul have you heard about this podcast? You have to listen to this podcast. It's all about you, Desperately Seeking Paul, etc. Paul Weller said, oh, yeah, I've heard something about this. What's his name? And Ricky, because <laughs> it was early days, right? Fair enough. Knew it was DJ, but couldn't quite remember. And he went, oh, I think his name's Don Johnson or something. And Paul went, <laughs> what? Fucking Miami Vice? I love that story. Thank you, Ricky. Cheers for the coffee. Brian as well. Thank you to you, my friend. Alex McLaughlin, as always, he says, I've suggested a book title since so many episodes are recorded online. How about Modem Classics? But would younger folk know what a modem is? No, probably not, Alex. is a good suggestion. We are going to turn this podcast into a book at some stage. Sean Farrell, thanks to you for your coffee. Much appreciated, my friend. Jamie Thompson, loving your podcast, Dan. Keep up the good work. Alan Ivory says, hi, Dan. I've recently... I recently started listening to your fantastic podcast and it really makes me smile. Just fans talking about someone that we like, a simple idea, but nailed perfectly. Cheers, Alan. Thanks for your message, mate. Thank you to all of you for your support. Don't forget, head to my website, grab a virtual coffee for a shout out next week. And on the next episode, a very, very, very special one. For the first time on this podcast series, I am joined by the bass legend from the jam, Bruce Foxton. Make sure you follow, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find me on social media as well. Get in touch on Twitter at Weller Fan Pod or on Instagram and Facebook, Paul Weller Fan Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.